The St. Patrick's Day Parade in Holyoke tomorrow is a day of celebration for everyone of Irish and non-Irish heritage. It's a day most people claim to have a little Irish blood in them, but there was a dark period in Ireland's history many years ago when a famine devastated the country. Today, Ireland is still trying to cope with the effects of this catastrophe of death and suffering. Steve Kiltonic has the story of the great hunger. In 1845, a deadly fungus attacked Ireland's staple food of the Irish tenant farmers, the potato. It was the beginning of a potato blight that devastated the Emerald Isle for the seven years that followed. It was a dark period known as the Great Hunger, or in Gaelic, on Gorta Moor. When it abated in 1852, a million Irish perished and two million abandoned the land that had abandoned them. Ireland's Great Hunger Museum at Quinnipiac University tells the story of the Irish famine in a way not found anywhere else in the United States, through art, artifacts, and literature. John Leahy is president of Quinnipiac University. He traces his own Irish heritage back to County Kerry, where his great-grandfather was born during the famine. In 1997, on the 150th anniversary of the Great Hunger, Leahy served as the Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. A speech he gave on the famine struck a chord with Quinnipiac alum and bagel entrepreneur Murray Lender, the founder of Lender's Bagels. Murray, who was Jewish, was taken by the hunger story in part because he associated it with the Holocaust, and also because his parents, who were from Poland, escaped the Nazis before World War II. He knew very well firsthand what it meant for his parents to have to leave their country, come to America, learn a new language, start a new life, and uh, give up everything. Lender donated money to the university to obtain art and materials to tell the great hunger story. What was gathered over the ensuing years became the Lender Family Collection Room, built in 2000 at the school library. So much art was collected that Murray helped construct the Great Hunger Museum, which opened in 2012. The Great Hunger story needs to be told and people need to be educated about it, not only because it was the greatest tragedy in Ireland's history and, and the worst disaster in 19th century Europe, but for the better part of 150 years, it was not accurately told. Grace Brady, the executive director of the museum, says the Irish survived blights before, but this one was much different. The problem with the Great Hunger was the severity of this blight and the successive years. Um, one of the winters was the coldest winters in Ireland's history, um, and it just devastated the crop. What the British did not want the world to know was that there was plenty of food in Ireland to feed the starving Irish. In fact, the years from uh, uh, 46, 47, 48, as the deaths were going up, the amount of food uh, exported out of Ireland, uh, literally past the, the starving mouths of uh, men, women, and children in Ireland, was shipped to England uh, and elsewhere in, in the British Empire. But it really was the, uh, the disregard and the, the callous disregard for human life on, behalf, on, on the part of the British and their, uh, their condescension and, and their view that the Irish and their culture and their religion and their, and their way of life was a kind of an inferior culture. So, some in British government even believed that the blight was providential. Entire Irish families were evicted into the freezing winter with nowhere to go. Typhus, cholera, and dysentery were rampant. People ate grass because there was no food. Because the land was more valuable than the presents, absentee English landlords offered fares for the six-week trip to America or Canada on the dreaded coffin ships. You were on the lower level. Most of the ships were not passenger type ships. You were with cattle and other animals. And the conditions were horrible. Um, disease was rampant. Um, there wasn't enough food. And so many people died on the journey here. When the museum was constructed, much thought went into its design. The plain exterior resembles an Irish workhouse, constructed as one of the relief measures put in place for the destitute. Downstairs is the lower gallery with the 19th century collection and the ceilings are very low, creating the feeling of being on a ship coming over. Upstairs, the feeling is much different. It's much brighter, the lighting, and the idea you come up the staircase and you've emigrated out of a bad situation into the new world. The Great Hunger Museum houses the world's largest collection of art related to the Irish famine. This includes paintings, drawings, etchings, and sculpture. It also features contemporary Irish artists, as well as 19th and 20th century paintings. The painting behind me is simply entitled Black 47. Michael Farrell's piece is dramatic and in your face. It was a very angry, 
man who hated the British government. Charles Trevelyan was the assistant secretary to the treasurer who basically decided what relief measures would be put into place during the famine. And he was a believer that the blight was a godsend. The most intriguing piece of the painting to me is the jury box because it represents different groups of people who helped the Irish during the famine. At the top of the stairs is Lillian Davidson's burying the child. I think it has a lot of dignity in the painting, even though it's difficult to look at a woman burying her child, but when you see how the woman's holding the child. This painting is by Daniel MacDonald called Irish Peasant Children, and it was a keystone to our collection because it's the only painting in the collection that was done during the years of the famine. These three children represent Ireland in different states. The middle child represents the west of Ireland, the dark, pretty uh, girl's face. The little guy in the upper right-hand corner with his hair all askew uh, is, is very mischievous. This girl here who's not facing us, she's not looking at us, she's looking away, and she's holding something that looks like a bottle, almost cocked like a missile or a gun. The collection also includes illustrated news documents from 1845 until 1852, which is also part of a database available free of charge to the public. Today, Ireland is still trying to come to terms with the famine. Even to have this level of exposure and recognition and activity related to the Great Hunger is still a little too challenging for the Irish, but I know it will come and I know the Irish, um, the Irish government officials, uh, many of whom have visited this museum, are very proud of what Quinnipiac University has done to um, commemorate the Great Hunger and to begin educating people about the true causes and consequences of Ireland's Great Hunger. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic.